sort of um, commemoration, Richard Pierpoint, uh, the Colored Corps and the Provincial Corps of Artificers has become established as a part of the popular history of Canada. A lot of people know about it, okay? But um, we wanted to find out what happened after 1815. Did they simply just disappear, meld into the community, you know? So there, this, but this is sort of our, our chronological starting point would be the War of 1812 and, and Richard Pierpoint. Mm -hmm. Now, here we go. The plot thickens. Uh, this aspect of uh, Canadian uh, history is a lot bigger than we realized, and it is in intimately interwoven with Niagara and southwestern Ontario. And the first thing that I discovered, we discovered, was that this black military history is uh, very much connected to the Underground Railroad. These, you know, um, uh, these uh, freedom seekers came north looking for freedom because once they got across the border, they were free. Okay, and only under extraordinary circumstances was they even considered if they could be sent back. And then um, enter Donna Ford. She's another um, uh, black historian, very involved in. Um, uh, what you putting to public notice or um, knowledge black history not just black military history and then her uncle James Grant military medal winner from Passchendaele November 1917 and if um, if our you know originator our muse was uh, Wilma uh, Donna was our um, pilot our steersman okay who kept us uh, on track as to what is important to the black community about putting this knowledge forward. Okay, because um, we aren't black. Okay, and um, uh, so we would miss a lot of the nuances. So we we relied on Donna to keep us in you know, in on track. One of the things she was very involved with is if you heard the, the settlement, the integrated settlement at Canfield. It was a thriving black and white community on Highway 3. Um, there's, at, at one time it was a village, and um, she was involved with uh, resurrecting the cemetery there. That's on a farmer's field, like clearing the brush and resurrecting the stones and putting it back together because it was a very thriving black-white community in the 1800s, and probably into, probably about the First World War. So that, you know, one of the aspects that people really don't know too much about. Yeah, so uh, very important source for us, and very important that she always brought the, the, the viewpoint in that we needed to see what's important to her as a black historian and therefore the black community. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the things, and I happened to mention this at the Canadian War Museum, when we were talking about um, putting a version of our exhibit in the Canadian War Museum, and when, uh, on the thing, uh, here's a very important aspect of black military history, especially from the, the 1800s before the British left circa 1870 and, and went home. We could always rely on them to shoot Americans. Okay? They'd been American, hadn't worked out well for them. They were here and they were staunchly, uh, um, staunch supporters of the crown. Okay? So, um, uh, you know, uh, 1812, the War of 1812, up to about 1870, is what the, this time period um, deals with. We have freedom seekers and the Underground Railroad in southwestern Ontario. Now, uh, older people like uh, Donna and Wilma, um, they didn't care what you called the people who came here on the Underground Railroad. But uh, some of the uh, younger black historians, they said, 
we prefer that you call these, these people by something positive. So they emphasize to us, we should use the term freedom seekers as opposed to escaped slaves. Okay? Even though it, it's, 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 a, it's a nuance, it, it's, escaped slaves is something like negative. Okay? They ran away. You know, they escaped. But freedom seekers is much more positive. They came here because they knew where they were coming to. Again, like, you know, Josiah Henson, come across from Buffalo, land on the beach there in, in Fort Erie. He's free. Mm -hmm. um, now, the very important part we found was the rebellions of 1837. Again, we could always rely on them to shoot Americans. Um, the uh, black troops who were helping guard the frontier from the rebels who were on Navy Island and just across at Lewiston and, and things like that. Um, the black troops wanted to be the forlorn hope. If they were going to attack Navy Island, they wanted to be in the first wave. Okay, so they knew casualties would be high, so that's why they were called the forlorn hope. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then they were also recruited when they dug the, the Welling Canal in 1840, 1844, okay? They were recruited to keep order amongst all the Irish navvies that were um, uh, feuding, um, fighting um, to secure jobs. It was, it was basically the wild, wild west as they were building this. And you had the men from Cork, fighting the, the other Irish Catholics from Connaught for jobs. Uh, they'd be stopping ships and, and seizing flour and that to just feed their families. And then they'd also be um, fighting with the, the Ulstermen, the Orangemen. So the Battle of Slabtown actually was uh, by Meriton, Ontario. And um, the, the, that one, the uh, black troops were willing to shoot in two directions. They were willing to shoot the, the, the Protestant Irish, and they were willing to shoot the uh, Catholic Irish. So very impartial, okay, at that time. Yeah. And then another aspect we found was one of our chaps, and amongst many, uh, went and joined up in the American Civil War. William Chandler, born in London, Ontario, another stop on the, important stop on the Underground Railroad, and working as a farmer and such around Fort Erie, Crossed the river, joined up with the, uh, with the American um, colored troops, and uh, uh, lost an arm in Florida. Uh, I think the battle was Oceala, and um, I don't, but that, don't quote me on that name, but it's very close to that, where he was wounded in the arm and had to hide out for a couple of days until Union troops came through and um, uh, rescued the wounded and tried to like bury the dead. And his arm had turned to with gangrene, so we have a postcard of him uh, with uh, some other veterans. And one of these days, we might even find out who those other veterans are. And he's sitting beside his wife, Lavinia, and they're living in Fort Erie. And he's got his empty sleeve pinned up on his uniform. He's wearing a Union uniform. And I think, um, I think it was the, what is it, the Grand Army of the Potomac. Um, Civil War, post-Civil War um, Veterans Association, yeah. Okay, and then after 1870, they seemed to disappear. When the British left, there wasn't a lot of, um, uh, let's see, uh, hmm, they weren't necessarily welcome in the Canadian militias that were formed after 1870. A uh, group out in, uh, who tried to form a um, Western Rifles uh, in, out on Vic Victoria, Van Vancouver Island. Um, none of the uh, other uh, white militia troops would train with them. Same out in Nova Scotia. So, um, so we've got this kind of um, dead zone after 1870 that we have to look into. Now, here's what we found when we were doing this, okay. Niagara is just not enough. But physical limitations on what we could do as far as research goes, 
that we really did have to do some limitations as to you know how big we make this project. So um, very interesting question. I don't know if the, Tim Cook is the chief historian at the Canadian War Museum. Has got some really really good books out, and he phoned up with a with a simple question. What he thought was a simple question. How were the Brights of Fort Erie related to the Harpers of Fort Erie and the Wilsons and the Chandlers of Fort Erie? Well, um, my wife, who was the chief researcher, told him, okay, get a paper and pencil and a ruler, and um, you get to be prepared to start drawing a lot of lines, because these families are very, very, very intertwined. Okay, so he told him, this is not a... This is not a light topic. In fact, Wilma told us, and so did Donna, when they were dating um, uh, other, you know, black Canadians, uh, when they were teenagers and that, uh, they sort of had to figure out if they were related and how closely they were related. Because the community was very small, okay? So yeah, there were often a lot of interconnections between the Brights, the Chandlers, the Harpers, uh, Wilsons, yeah. Interesting story about Wilson, came across, had joined the Union Army, uh, deserted, took his tent and his blanket with him, um, was helped across the border at Detroit, the Detroit River there, uh, by a Canadian who was a horse dealer. So um, as he crossed the river, he discarded his old slave name and he became a Wilson and lived in Fort Erie. Okay, yeah. So what we found out was we really needed to make this into something bigger, to recognize more area. And it really did Brantford, Hamilton, London, Collingwood, North Buxton, and we, we made contact with a whole group of families that had all this history. Browns, Duncans, Johnsons, Nicholsons, Hogans, Hocans, Dawsons, Grants, Smiths, you say Wilsons, um, Harpers, um, Brights, and, and all of this history was contained inside those families. And it was, uh, it was really quite interesting, like if we had um, one of our volunteers grew up in St. Catharines, fortunately in a working class district on Facer Street. And in that district, that's where everybody lived who was working class. So it didn't matter if you were Polish or black or, you know, working class um, English or whatever. You all live in the same neighborhood. So it just by chance again, one of our volunteers, Maggie, had lived with a lot of these families and gone to school with them, gone to dances and gone to movies with, with a lot of these. So there was another whole opening of, uh, of family histories we can get into. Um, we'll get into this a little bit. You can see, uh, again, relationships. The Nicholsons are related to the Hogans, the Hocans, and the Smiths. So you really do have to sit down with a, um, a paper and a pencil and start putting names down and start connecting up the dots. Okay? Same thing. Um, you know, I, I think that later in the slide we'll talk about the Hocans and the Hogans. Mm -hmm. Okay, getting back, getting back to uh, World War I, so to speak, because, like I say, from the 1870s through to about, you know, the start of World War I, um, black Canadians in the military weren't necessarily that well accepted, okay, in local militia units. Um, not that they were specifically barred by Sir Sam Hughes, okay? But you had people like um, the, the chief of the, the defense staff, um, General Watkin from England, a uh, very, very, very low opinion of um, black Canadians and uh, black people in, in general. And his idea was, um, um, more than racist, I would say extremely bigoted, in that when the um, second construction battalion was going to sail, okay, 
um, and they had to wait for a convoy, he said, well, just let them all sail by themselves, which would have been easy meat for a U-boat. Well, fortunately, the Royal Navy doesn't send ships and soldiers out to be sunk by U-boats unless they, if they have anything to say about it. So in fact, uh, they didn't. They sailed in a convoy and got over to England. But you had people like General Watkin. Another one was uh, Otter, General Otter, who had been in the Boer War, had a very, very low opinion of uh, black people in general and black Canadians, okay? And, but on the, on the side of the black community, one of their biggest lobbyists was uh, a school principal, Arthur Alexander of North Buxton, down near Chatham area, you know, southwest Ontario. And he petitioned through the Sam Hughes. And what came out of it was, if the commanding officer would, would accept black Canadians into his unit, Okay, um, that would be okay. So people like Grant, and if you look, can you find James Grant in that picture? Back row, about the middle. He's six feet tall and 180 some pounds, which at the time would be a pretty big guy at, at age 19. Okay, so there he is, and. The, um, at Major Lancaster, an old St. Catharines family, we think the Lancasters knew the Grant family. And he took James Grant into his unit as a driver in his artillery battery. Okay? So it was up to the commanding officer. Yeah. Now, what they, the other thing they did do is they established a segregated black battalion, number two construction battalion. It was a non combat construction battalion, so, um, and we'll get into that a little bit, but there's their um, uh, motto, they gave us shovels, not rifles, okay? Now, interestingly enough, James Grant was in the 49th Battery, and later served in the 83rd Howitzer Battery. His brother, who Donna, Donna Ford said, that would be another one of her uncles, was a, a smidgen of a troublemaker, ended up in the number two uh, construction battalion, the segregated battalion, okay? Mm -hmm. Okay, um, this is um, my wife, and she was the main researcher driver behind this whole project, and uh, did a lot of the work, and we ended up getting a $5,000 grant from Veterans Affairs Canada when we were on a telephone conference with the Canadian War Museum and said we put this together for uh, $5,000, they, uh, they kind of smirked. I don't know that they can open their door to the museum over there for $5,000 type thing, okay? But, um, you know, when we didn't have any money, uh, that picture of James uh, Grant is actually 22 different pieces off a program called Canva. So you take a big picture, and you, you tell the program to print it, and it printed out 22 different pieces of paper, and we laminated them all, and we set them out on one of our library tables, and we taped them all together, and we came up with James Grant, life-size James Grant, okay? For probably about $10. <laughs> you know, that's the nice thing, right? Eh? Mm-hmm. Yeah, but uh, she, uh, she did a lot of the, she did the work on this. And another thing that she found was, out of Fort Erie, there was Lance Sergeant John Bright. He also won a military medal at Passchendaele for devotion to duty. Okay? And um, if you go in the exhibit, in fact, if you look at this pull-up here of, of James Grant, we put it in the wrong place, but there's his citation for his military medal. Okay? He probably should have won at least two military medals at that battle. He should have got a medal and a bar, but they kind of rationed them around and spread them out to the rest of the, uh, the crew and that, so he ended up with this medal for that particular action, okay? So Kathy did a lot of the work and the artwork and all this, okay? And she discovered that on the war memorial in Fort Erie is John Wright. And we looked at it and we did some work and we looked him up He's a black Canadian. Nowhere is it noted, and he was part of the Welland Canal Field Force. He joined 
the 44th Lincoln and Welland Militia Regiment in August 10, 1914. Okay. And another case of the Bright family, like the Grant family, had been in Fort Erie for probably 100 years at that time. So they were very integrated into the community. And um, there was no problem for John Bright to join up be with the 44th Regiment. Okay. He very shortly uh, went across and, and traveled with the 36th Battalion out of Hamilton and ended up um, over in um, um, France in 1915 and was very severely wounded at the Battle of Mont Sorel. So he, he was in the hospital for a year, so he missed Vimy. Unfortunately, John Bright didn't come home. Uh, he's buried near Cambrai. In the last hundred days, he was killed. I think September 2nd, 1918. Um, just, a, just a crying shame that such a, um, a, a great soldier um, didn't make it back to Canada. Okay? But he's, he's, he's buried over there. One of these days, I'll go visit his grave and we'll put up his picture there beside his grave. Okay? Lance Sargent. It shows you his abilities in that, you know, um, they didn't necessarily promote people you know, all the time. You had to have some ability. You had to be a good soldier. And that's why he won his military medal for devotion to duty during the Battle of Passchendaele. Mm -hmm. Okay, so where do, where do we look for uh, stories of people in the, in the CEF? The Canadian Expeditionary Force for World War I and, and other, other ones too. Okay, Library and Archives Canada, you can uh, search the Canadian Expeditionary Force database, okay, and all 640,000 records are there. And um, it takes a little bit of finesse sometimes to figure out. Uh, the one I have to look up once in a while because I forget his service number is uh, Red Hill, the famous riverboat man for Niagara Falls and the Niagara Rapids. Well, you know how many hills there are in 640,000 names? There's more than two, okay? So I actually have to write him down and write down his service number and keep it handy. So when I want to look up again, I have to use his service number to try and find him in that huge database. But we, one of the things we do is we look um, in that database and we search for people, okay? Uh, interesting little aside story. Uh, a chap came in and their family name is Fayella. And they knew that their um, great grandfather, or their grandfather, great grandfather, had served in World War I. Come over from Italy, served in World War I. But they weren't sure about the spelling of the name Faella. So, mm, how do we search for him? And one of our volunteers came up, well, what was his first name? Well, his name was Pasquale, but he was known in English as Patsy. Well, guess what? Out of 640,000, Records. If you search Patsy, you'll find there were five Patsies. Okay, and guess who is one of them? Patsy Fayella. So yeah, they were, we were able to send him home with a with his whole uh, little history of how he'd come, and he you know he was he was illiterate. I don't even know that he knew how to spell his name in English, but he signed his attestation papers with an X. So you know that's where you can go look for World War One especially. Um, if there are fatality. Another good place to look is the Commonwealth Graves Commission website. A okay. lot of information on those. And you'll even see connections because the headstones and that, or there will be a reference to son of, or of such, of somebody from St. Catharines or Niagara Falls or Hamilton or whatever. Okay. Ancestry.ca has the World War II fatalities, 1939 to 1947. And at the museum, we have a, a free account, so we can search their free databases. And we do that on a regular basis. So these, you know, we can look for these stories. And where we were, we had all of our families, the Johnsons, the Browns, Duncans, oh, Smiths, Wilsons, um, Harpers, plus our volunteer Maggie Craig, who just happened to go to school with the Nicholsons, the Smiths, the Hogans, who can and knew all these people. I went to school with them. I know I can phone his mother and we'll talk to her. Okay? Yeah. And the interesting thing was 
that came to me was the Canadian War Museum had no access to this information. It wasn't available um, as a scholarly work. It was still oral history inside the families. Okay? So I, I, I think we've opened up a new vista for them. A new, a new, and I, I think there was a chap who, I think he's at Laurier, doing military studies. I, caught, I talked to him a little bit about this too, and I think he's looking into it. Mm -hmm. So that's where we got our stories from. Okay. And as, as we were looking at, up this, okay, the um, um, Veterans Affairs Canada, which is you know connected to the Vimy Center, all of a sudden we get a call from them. Uh, we saw the newspaper article about James Grant Military Medal, and we'd like to know more about him. Okay, um, and, and they were quite wow. We didn't know this either. Um, James Grant was at Vimy. He was with the 83rd Howitzer's Battery. Came there in March of 1917, and he was there for the battle, servicing his, his, uh, his howitzer, you know, 4.5 inch howitzer with the, with the crew. And uh, also, we think there were about six more black soldiers in the front lines there, and at least four of them came from Niagara. Okay, we're with Niagara units. Mm -hmm. So they were very, very interesting, and before COVID hit, we were, we were really trying to see if we could get James Grant at the Vimy Center in France, okay? Um, I, I think they did do an exhibit there, but it's um, more of a diversity exhibit, but I, I think maybe he's there. I'll, I'll have to get in touch with him again. So between uh, the, the Veterans Affairs and that, we got a $5,000 grant. And we put together our exhibit, and we put together two traveling exhibits. Okay, and um, um, we uh, sent them around, and the best response we got is if we could find a champion in a school board. They would um, uh, like with the upper grand. The upper grand is full of old historic black settlements. The upper grand district school. I don't know, what, are you part of Upper Grand here? Yeah. Okay. Up towards Shelburne, Oro, all of those places, okay? And you know who champions it? The librarians. They, they, you know, we had a connection from where my daughter's teaching in Peel to another teacher who's, who, whose husband teaches up in Upper Grand. And our, our traveling exhibit uh, went to a, a lot of their different schools. And a lot of young children, uh, you know, young Canadians saw it. And I, I think it was, it was quite an eye opener. Uh, mostly because the story is so positive. You know, they, these are role models. And, you know, here's what we found out like, number two construction battalion. Um, personally, as you know, uh, someone who thinks they know a lot about the CEF, I, I was quite, I was dumbfounded to know that we actually had a segregated battalion. Never heard of it, you know. Uh, through all the histories I've read, that not a, not a peep. Well, now there's there's through um, uh, was it Senator Calvin Rook put out a, a couple of books, different editions, and others. And now you had the uh, memorial at Pit Two to the Second Construction Battalion because a lot of their troops came from there. Well, a lot came from Niagara. Some 20 to 25 came out of right out of Niagara region. Okay and we're part of it. Uh, now I must apologize for that top picture. It's so evocative of the what the second construction battalion did, um, but those are actually Americans. They're from Wisconsin. And they were also put in segregated battalions as construction battalions. But basically it was such a good picture that it captured what happened to the to the uh, black Canadians who joined up with the second Canadian uh, second construction battalion that we, we had to use it and, and you can see that uh, they were uh, doing forestry in the Ural mountains okay and uh, they they built, they had records for the, the amount of lumber that they produced they were very very hard and they weren't necessarily treated very well um, 
if you look at, um, uh, there's a, a movie out, um, oh, oh, I can't remember his name, uh, by a Canadian actor who put together a, the story of his uh, grandfather who was a chaplain, uh, one of possibly two um, officers, black officers in the Canadian forces in World War I. And he was, as a chaplain, he had to be a captain, even though it was maybe honorary or nominal. He was still a, an officer. And his experiences uh, with that, Anthony Sherwood, that's a chap's name, he has a movie out about the experiences of his, uh, his, great, his grandfather in World War I. And if you look at the movie, you'll see a connection to Anne Murray. Okay, so you got to look up the movie, Anthony Sherwood, okay? Yeah. So they were doing, in fact, very dangerous work. Uh, where I'm from, uh, logging has been around for a couple of centuries, and I know it's one of the most dangerous occupations you can have. Very, very, very hard work, especially at that time. It was all by hand. Hand by horses, maybe some steam engines. Okay, so they did, they did very good work. And they, they were also um, uh, working you know, behind, uh, behind the lines and such. Um, and then you got a picture one of one chap there. Um, let's see. I think I know. I think that's Wilma's. I think that is. Uh, that might be one of Wilma's relatives there. Okay. Mm -hmm. And there was a stamp issue not so long ago. Okay, for the Second Construction Battalion. Mm -hmm. And then out of the blue. We had sent a, a little bit of stuff up, our copy of our uh, e-copy of our resource book that Wet Kathy had put together on our whole exhibit, so teachers could use it as a resource. And they got back to us, uh, and we had offered them one of our traveling exhibits. Well, okay, you know, <clears throat> that was fine. But they liked the concept. They liked the idea. Um, they had nothing on it, really that they could put out. So they took um, uh, uh, our information and they adapted it to their own version in the space they had. And they did a wonderful, wonderful job. And it was actually open from um, Black History Month, February 2021. And it finally came down in September the 5th of 2023. But again, we'll talk about that. And they got a huge response, very, very well received by visitors. Okay, and and you can see, you can see what money accomplishes when you're in a museum. Okay, if you have the million dollar budgets and Toronto Dominion as a sponsor, you can do things. <laughs> Just little guys, we don't. They weren't putting their pictures together from Canva. Let's put it that way. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then, you know, we, we're not only that, we wanted to finish up, and you used this on one of your posters. That's a Harper, okay? Um, oh, I forget his, uh, Ernest Harper, yeah. Um, and um, then there's the Korean War, and that's uh, David Johnson, okay? Um, he was with the Queen's Own Rifles as a signaler. And then Major Ed Smith, um, RCAI. Well, um, World War II came along. Uh, attitudes in Canada had changed quite a bit. Um, but the RCAF and the R Royal Canadian Navy, eh, not really welcome. But then we have the very interesting story of Junius Hukan. And that's how you're supposed to say it, Hukan, okay? From uh, one of our contacts, Ron Nicholson. Black historian out in uh, Victoria, who's related to the Hogan Sokans. Now, the story behind that name, and Junius, the, uh, the Hogans had a Hawaiian band, okay? But Hogan doesn't sound very Hawaiian. So they changed their name to Hokan, and they became Hawaiians in a Hawaiian band, okay? So on Junius's, and, and um, on his attestation paper, he's actually listed as Hawaiian, okay? Great joke inside the black community in St. Catharines. 
Okay, great, great joke that he's Hawaiian. Okay, yeah, really, really interesting. Um, uh, very brilliant young man, Spitfire pilot. Uh, we believe he flew wingman for uh, Air Commodore Johnny Johnson at Dieppe. Um, he was working on a navigational instrument because he had trained as a draftsman in high school in Section St. Catharines. And on his last operational flight, coming back, ran out of gas over the, um, due to headwinds over the channel. Uh, last words is, uh, I'm bailing out boys and it was never found, you know. Junius Hokan. Hokan okay? Now, but in the Canadian Army, you had um, a, a little bit different story. Okay? It was um, pretty open to everybody that wanted to sign up. So we had um, Ernest Harper here, young man, married with children, signs up, uh, goes over to Italy. And he was in the service corps, basically driving a truck, uh, qualified on a Sten gun. He had a Sten gun in his truck with him. And he was killed in uh, some of the fierce battles in, in Italy. And we don't know a whole lot about him. But what we did find, when we started looking up his records, you've got three letters behind his name. M-I-D. Mentioned in dispatches. Okay. Now, uh, according to one, uh, one of our experts, there are two medals you can get uh, posthumously. Victoria Cross and Mentioned in Dispatches. We need to do, or somebody needs to do, more searching through records, trying to find his unit. And because it's a service corps, they're kind of melded in with a lot of different units. And somebody needs to ferret out the um, war diary for his unit and see what he did when he was killed to get this later put on his, uh, posthumously put on his, on his uh, title, uh, mentioned in dispatches. Very, very interesting story. Okay? And then we have um, <coughs> Pudge Dawson. Uh, Pudge, originally from Toronto, uh, moved to St. Catharines to work in the foundry. Okay? Uh, lived in the Fraser Street area, in a working class neighborhood. So him and his uh, four, four buddies, um, um, Dominic uh, De Napoli, um, Joe Boudreau, Pudge, and uh, was it Tommy Lee? All joined the army at the same time, but they didn't want to walk. So they actually went to Brantford and signed up with the artillery, because the artillery has trucks. Okay. So um, Pudge signed up, went across, um, served until the end of the war, landed at Normandy and such. Uh, sent back a war trophy to his, to his wife, which was the the aircraft recognition swastika on a half track. So I guess they shot up the half track and then took the flag off it and Pudge mailed it home to his wife as a war trophy. Okay? But then in, in the Korean War, you've got uh, David Johnson there and related to the BME Church because his dad was the pastor of the BME Church. Actually turned 18 on the boat going over to Korea. Okay? And then uh, for the present, um, Find Major Ed Smith in that picture. You know, actually, he does a lot of work in Africa, in Cameroon. Okay, so in, in the Canadian Forces, it's not like James Grant. Find James Grant, ah, uh, right there. No, Major Smith is in the picture, but you actually have to look for him. Okay, and pick him up inside the mix. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And last but not least, um, what's next? Okay. <coughs> well, when I put this slide together, uh, the Canadian War Museum was still up, and finally it did come down the 5th of September of 2023. And all, by all reports, they wanted to keep it up because it was very, very well received by visitors. Very well received. The, the artwork and such that they did on it was truly mind mind boggling. Like boy, you can see this is what a really good museum a, a professional museum exhibit is supposed to look like with all of the information that they you know put put with it. Really, really great. But what they are doing, it currently in production, they're doing a national traveling exhibit to come out for the fall of twenty twenty four. 
So they're taking our material from that started off in our little museum, the Niagara Military Museum. They're going to add material from the East Coast, the West Coast, and also Saskatchewan. Okay. And they're going to meld it all together and come up with a national traveling exhibit. Um, our traveling exhibits are pull up, 10, 10, 10 banners that pull up kind of thing. You can send around the schools. Um, it was in circulation in Peel District. Um, it, it, it is still at the Brantford Military Heritage Museum, another big stop on the Underground Railroad is Brantford. Okay, they have their own uh, BME church and such there. Um, um, we have um, the, uh, the, the, the one that was in Peel District School Board, the traveling exhibit that was there, okay, it went to the Canadian Forces Outreach Detachment in Toronto. And um, the uh, chap from Peel, who's in the Army as a Lieutenant Colonel, Lieutenant Colonel Scott Moody, um, he got it over to these people, and it was up at his um, military detachment at Downsview for quite a while. And then, much to his astonishment, he finds out that it's now uh, up at the National Defense Headquarters in Ottawa. And they never told him. So I said, Scott, or Colonel, Colonel Scott, uh, would you please, you know, get some pictures and send it to us so we can put it on our website, on our on our Facebook page, to show, you know, the sort of the evolution and, and you know the, the life this thing still has. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, personally, I, I'd still like to see James Grant at the uh, the Vivi Center in France. Okay, and he's he's quite a person. He's old um, when he passed away. <clears throat> I don't know. <laughs> um, his uh, former commander, Colonel Lancaster, said um, he was a good man and a good soldier. <clears throat> so, mm -hmm. so uh, any questions that you have? Yeah. Okay. Um, since James Grant went into the artillery, yes. you said there were 25 um, Soldiers from the Niagara area that went to the, the works of time, the number two. Yeah, out of about 600. Yeah, why yeah. did they not go with J James and the artillery? Why did they? I, I think it was on a personal basis from the commander. Okay, like his, James's brother, John, went into the second, you know, the second construction battalion. And, and his, his niece, Donna, said John was a bit of a troublemaker. Okay, so. Um, uh, Perhaps Major Lancaster pushed them towards the second construction battalion. It, it all had to do with what the commander wanted or, or what he knew or what he would allow. Okay? Um, if you look at our resource book that it should be online, you'll see that there was uh, a, there's actually a big letter that was published in December of 1917 in the St. Catherine Standard from one of James's uh, comrades back to his mother in St. Catharines talking about James Grant and his, his um, gallantry at the Battle of Passchendaele. And that's why you know, what he has in that letter said he should have got the military medal uh, plus the bar, which would mean like a second issue of the military medal. He should have got two military medals for just that one battle. But they had to spread them around, so he ended up with one for this particular citation. But there's another instance in that letter where he probably should have got the military medal for that one also for the same battle. Do you know what he did to earn the military medal? Um, this one here, he brought forward um, through that all those shell holes, that um, ammunition to his battery twice. Like traffic control had closed what was left of the road because it was, it was simply too dangerous. There was so much German shelling going on, it was simply too dangerous. But James Grant uh, took ammunition from the, you know, the ammunition park, um, artillery park, and brought it up through that artillery uh, barrage, German artillery barrage, to his battery because he knew they were short on ammunition, and he did it twice. Okay, so that's why he got the military medal at at, um, uh, at Passchendaele, and um, John Bright also got a military medal at Passchendaele. And his was for devotion to duty. And um, once they had established, um, uh, attacked, and it's had, had um, 
prepared for a counterattack. He volunteered to be a guide to go back and bring up fresh relief troops. Again, another very hazardous job through all of the German shelling and, and gunfire and such. And so for devotion to duty, he got his military medal also at, at Passchendaele. Mm -hmm. yeah. Quite interesting. Quite, quite, it, is, it really opened my eyes to a lot of um, things about the world, First World War that I had no clue, no clue whatsoever. And I thought I was pretty knowledgeable about the CEF in World War I. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, any of your exhibit come back from the war museum? That no, it's really not suitable for us. They have a space that's uh, about oh five meters high and about oh thirty meters long. So they manufacture exhibits to match that space. Um, we may have some pictures of it on our Facebook page. If they don't, I'll get some posted. And you can see just uh, a really, really professional, high-quality uh, museum exhibit that they put together. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. What what money and money and, and people resources can produce is truly astonishing. And all of us in our little regional civic municipal museums um, get a little, little bit green with envy some days. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you very well, much. Thank you. Very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. I, I, I hope so. Yeah, that was wonderful.